Okay. Let's record on the cloud or computer. Okay. Here we are in module number five. We're actually going to spend two weeks in this module. I'll explain what that means at the end of the lecture. As with every chapter, there is a do I know this to gauge your knowledge before starting this lecture. Uh, and then you'll have the quiz afterwards. See how well you've improved. A review of the HTTP protocol. As this chapter focuses a lot on web applications, you need to be well versed in the HTTP protocol. Uh, for example, HTTP 1.1 is the protocol defined in RFC 7230 through 7235. An HTTP server is synonymous with web server. An HTTP client is synonymous with a browser. We have proxies. We have API clients and other custom HTTP client programs. HTTP itself is a very simple protocol and that is a good and it's also a bad thing. In most cases, HTTP is stateless. It is not reliant on a persistent connection. This is why you can have a browser up and logged onto a web page. And if you lose connection or uh, you move too far from your access point or you know, your network state changes in any way, you are still able to reconnect to that site when you refresh because it is not dependent on you being connected all the time to that server in order to pass either new information or update. This is why you can uh, do forms like a Google form without having to be connected to the internet and then get back on and upload the information. HTTP transactions consist of a single request from a client to a server with a single response back. So you don't, you're not looking at a whole lot of packets if we are looking at this from Wireshark. A server must maintain the state of the interaction with the client throughout the transmission of successive commands until that interaction is terminated. This is also called the session. So it is not the job of the client to keep the connection up. It's the job of the server to keep track of how many devices are connected, what they're doing or where they were last and wait until the client or the browser says, okay, we're done. Proxies act as both a server and a client as they make request web servers on behalf of other clients. Proxies enable things like uh, transfer across firewalls, caching HTTP messages, uh, network address translation, filtering, and so on. They're also great treasure trove of information if you are attacking a proxy. HTTP is a layer seven protocol in the OSI model using TCP as the underlying protocol. When a client and a server connect or they communicate, they perform their interactions based on headers as well as body content. This picture shows you that in order to make an HTTP request response, the underlying protocol is TCP, that to make that connection, once that's established, now we can transfer information. 
Here is a picture from Wireshark on the headers and body content. We have the get request for content. We can see what type of agent, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. There are various methods. Methods belong right here. So you'll see things like get, head, post, trace, put, delete, options, and connect. The URI and or the path to resource field represents the path portion of the requested URL. In this case, we're looking at a slash. The request version number specifies the version of HTTP used by the client. In this case, 1.1. And the user agent is what application is being used. In this case, it is a Mozilla-based Ubuntu system. Servers will respond with a three-digit status code. And there are five different sets. There's the 100, which is informational the 200s, which is successful, the 300s, which is redirection, 400s means client error, 500 means server error. Whenever you see, for example, anything in the 400s, that means the error is on the client side, not the server. Anything that's 500 is on the server side. Anything 300, if you're going to amazon.com and it gets redirected to www.amazon.com, you'll see a 300 uh, message. Here's an example of a 200 response. This is okay. No problems, things were successful. A URL is broken up into these pieces. The red is the scheme designating the underlying protocol that's going to be used. Blue is the host, or the dark blue is the host, either an IP address or, a, or the DNS address of the web server. Next will be the port in green. And that is specifically if we're listening to something that's not on port 80 or 443. We have the path, path from the root directory of the server to the designated resource. Web servers can also use aliases so they don't explicitly say where are, are, are the folders. And then you have anything like query strings that are associated with the request in yellow. So I mentioned that there are different versions of HTTP. Here are the two, HTTP 1.1 and 2. Obviously, the older one takes more steps to uh, get actions done, whereas the new one has multiplexing. So for example, in 1.1, we had to make a separate request to get a CSS file and get a JavaScript file. In 2.0, we can do these two requests at once and they get one response back. Uh, so web sessions, which is what you see here. Oh, sorry, web sessions. They can include pre-authentication tasks, authentication process, session management, access control, and session finalization. 
Web applications create these sessions and keep track of anonymous users after the first user request or after the first user has authenticated. That way the application can identify the user on any subsequent requests, applying any ACLs and using session ID tokens. Through this, it is possible to identify any specific development framework being used for the site. For example, if you see in this communication things like PHP SES ID, then we know it's PHP. If it's JES session ID, it's J2EE. Anything that's CFID or CF token is Cold Fusion, and anything ASP.NET is Microsoft. These things become important when we're trying to find vulnerabilities. If we can find out the version, if we can find out the type, the framework, we can narrow down our search into what we need in order to get in. There are multiple mechanisms to maintain the session state. The one that's most often used is a cookie. There are two types of cookies, if you didn't know. There is the non-persistent and the persistent. If a cookie has a max age or expires attribute, then it's considered persistent and stored on the disk by the browser until it expires. Modern applications are being built with non-persistent, which are deleted once the browser is closed. Or, you know, you can make Firefox or like Brave delete everything when you uh, exit the browser. So anything that, any cookies that are persistent, they'll go away. And uh, the difference or the reason why 1.1 and 2 or 1.1 did one at a time, well, that's how it was built. And then when 2.0 came around, it came to fix that. That way there's less packets flying over the wire or over the air and we get more information in and out. For this realm, web application exploitation, OWASP is your friend. The Open Web Application Security Project. They're a nonprofit foundation that work to improve security of software. Their biggest thing is web applications and they have lots of tools and toys to learn and defend. They're the ones who have that top 10 list of the top 10 vulnerabilities that exist in web applications. And sadly, the top 10 list hasn't, hasn't had a need to get updated since 2017 because those same vulnerabilities still exist today. Uh, that you know that they're part of your, your classwork to attend their online sessions. And I hope that they have been uh, very fruitful because uh, all the times that I've attended, it's been great. Always walk out learning something new. Moving on as I take a sip of water. That's an overview of HTTP. Moving down the line to SQL and more specifically SQLi. The most common SQL statements that you should be familiar with, and I don't mean that you should be a database administrator, I mean you need to be familiar with it, are select, update, delete, insert into, create database, alter database, create table, alter database, drop table, create index and drop index. Typically, SQL statements are divided into various categories like data definition language, data manipulation, transaction control, system control, embedded SQL. Here is a basic SQL statement. Now, SQL injection has two main categories, the in-band and out-of-band. In-band 
attackers obtain data using the same channel to inject SQL code, whereas out of band, attackers retrieve data using different channels like email, text, instant messaging, or something else. Here is an example of SQL being in a URL. There is the blind or the inferential SQL I. An attacker reconstructs information by sending specific statements and discerning behavior of the application and database. Useful behaviors in a blind SQL attack are things like HTTP 500, 404s, and redirects. So that'll give us information that we can use. Union operator allows a select statement to combine two queries in a single result or a set of results. We can again use this to jump from one to another. So we're looking at, we want to look at the customers and suppliers in one shot. You can also use Boolean to verify whether certain conditions are true or false. Uh, there are the error-based techniques to force the database to generate an error that will allow us to enhance or refine an attack. There's time delay where attackers can use this when they don't get any specific input or I mean, sorry, any output or error messages from an application. But errors really are your, your gold nuggets because errors will tell us information pretty easily like this where we see that it's a MySQL server connected in a Microsoft system. So it's a Windows box that's in the back. The ways to defend this stuff, the SQL I mitigations, they include static queries or immutable queries. These do not contain data that could be interpreted. Here is an example of a static mitigation. Here's an example of an immutable. Moving on from SQLi. We have the command injection vulnerabilities. This is scary. Being able to execute commands through a vulnerable application, those vulnerable applications are able to pass commands and execute them in a system shell. It's not as popular in current modern applications because they have better defenses. That's not to say they are always implemented, that just because someone is using the latest application framework, they won't be vulnerable. It always depends on how it's built, but you'll have a less chance of success doing command injections through modern application frameworks. It's possible. It just might be harder, but nonetheless, it is something to, you know, if you're attacking something to keep in mind, if you're defending something to uh, enforce, that there's no way that a user can do something like this where they're pinging a device, but they also ran this command and show what's in Etsy password. Furthering in the realm, we have exploiting authentication-based vulnerabilities. 
This could be online or offline. Online is the easy to detect. Those are like a brute force where they're, they're sending uh, attempt after attempt on the network and you can see the, the packets with username and passwords. The offline is the one that we can't see because they'll take a hash and they'll use any other system to do things like rainbow tables or hash cat or you name it to figure it out. Uh, it's something that I mentioned in my CIS 75 and the offer stands for 76 that uh, if you have a 12 terabyte external USB 3.0, I can give you a copy of my rainbow tables. It is that big, it is that much. But yeah, uh, you could download the tables yourself, but again, it's about 12 terabytes. That's gonna take forever and a day to download, but I can copy it via USB. Anywho, here's some algorithms with the recommendation of being used versus not being used, like deaths should be avoided, like the like uh, COVID, whereas things like SHA-256 and SHA-512, those, those are access, uh, acceptable. There's also some things like session hijacking, redirecting attacks, and default credentials. With session hijacking, it's the, your basic man in the middle or man in the browsers. Redirects, if you can get on the network and do things like an R poison or a DNS poison, you could do that. Or default credentials, because people don't like to change passwords, you can get a list of the most commonly used passwords and probably be able to get in. Uh, this picture shows you some parameter pollution. This is a problem. If multiple HTTP parameters have the same name, they can cause an application to interpret values incorrectly via input validation, trigger application errors, modify internal values. These can lead to either server or client side attacks. So as Defender, we need to see what our applications are doing and ensure that they're not using the same parameters. As an attacker, if we see something like this, we know we can use it to add extra parameters and get our way in. Our next item is cross-site scripting. This is a common vulnerability resulting in the installation or the execution of malicious code, account compromise, session cookie hijacking, revelation modification of local files, or even site redirection. This picture shows you the five steps for a reflected cross-site scripting otherwise known as a non-persistent cross-site scripting. This occurs when malicious code or scripts are injected by a vulnerable web application using any method that yields a response as part of a valid HTTP request. For example, a user being persuaded to follow a malicious link to a vulnerable server that'll inject that malicious code into the user's browser. So here, we have the attacker finds a vulnerability in the server that they're targeting. The attacker sends a malicious link to the victim. The attacker clicks on the malicious link. The attack is sent to the vulnerable server. The attack is reflected to the victim and executed. And the victim sends information depending on the attack to the attacker. 
essentially, we found a vulnerability in this server. So we're going to use this in our place. So it's going to look like the attack came from the victim, not from us. Stored cross-site scripting or persistent. Malicious code is permanently stored on a vulnerable or a malicious server's database, typically carried out on blog posts, web forums, or any other permanent storage method. And then you also have things like document object model or DOM-based attacks. And there are evasion and mitigations that are provided by OWASP that you can check out. The cross-site request forgery, CSRF or XSRF, occurs when unauthorized commands are transmitted from a user that is trusted by the application. This is different from cross-site scripting because they exploit the trust an application has in a browser. In other words, they're using the identity of a valid user. In this example, the URL contains the parameters password equals new test and password underscore conf equals test and change equals change number. As long as the user follows the link, an attacker can easily send a crafted link to any user to change their password. Continuing in the awesome list of vulnerabilities that exist on web-based applications, clickjacking. It's basically a user interface redress attack using multiple transparent or opaque layers to induce a user into clicking on a web button or a link on a page that they didn't intend to. Those user keystrokes can also be clickjacked through a CSS style sheet, an iframe, and text boxes fooling the user into entering information or clicking links. The two most common techniques to prevent or to mitigate clickjacking, according to OWASP, are to send the proper security policy or CSP frame headers to instruct the browser not to allow framing of, from other domains, and two, use defensive code in the application to make sure current frame is top level window. These things are thoroughly documented in on OWASP's website. If you are running a web server, you should be applying these things to your sites. Next, we have directory transversal. It is possible to access the files and directory stored outside of a web root folder. It is possible to go around the disk, see what's inside and capture what we need. For example, this works. So here we have a server listening on port 66. Here would be the, the pages that we would go into, right into the vulnerabilities folder, into the file folder. But we can use something like this to get out of this folder, this folder, out of the web root folder. And this might be. Uh, HTML, and then there might be a www folder, and then might be a var folder, and that'll take us back to the root, and then make our way elsewhere. If the website or the web server is smart enough to block dot dot slash, well, you can also use this these different functions as well. This is all the same as this.
so you can get around a web server, whether it's Linux or Windows, to see what's in them. I'm going to throw you some best practices that I would pray you would either implement or exploit. Understand how the underlying operating system processes file names provided by a user or an application. So that's going to depend if this is a Windows or a Linux box. Never store sensitive configuration files inside the web root directory because they're visible by everyone. Prevent user input when using file system calls. Prevent users from supplying all parts of a path. Surround the user input with your path code. And input perform input validation by only accepting known good input. I have a few more. File inclusion vulnerabilities. There is LFI and RFI. LFI, the local file inclusion, vulnerability occurs when a web app allows a user to submit input into files or upload files to the server. Successful exploitation could allow an attacker to read or execute files on the victim system. Some LFI vulnerabilities can be critical, especially if a web application is running with high privileges or for whatever reason, it's running as root. Then there's the remote file inclusion, similar to LFI, with the difference being the attacker is able to execute code hosted on his own system rather than running it on the server. Now I have this picture up here for the last section, the insecure code practices. Um, again, these are things that as security folks, we've been seeing it for like 20, 25, 30 years, and they're still happening. For example, comments in the source code. Often developers include information in the source code that could provide too much info and be leveraged by an attacker, but they comment it out. So it shouldn't take effect, right? But if you are able to look at the source code, you're able to see the comments and be able to get that information, such as system passwords, API credentials, or sensitive information. This happens all the time. And a place where developers do this often is GitHub. Another one is lack of error handling or overly verbose error handling. Again, if a system can tell us errors, we can find out things like what is the application running or what operating system is running or what version number is running. That's bad because that attacker can use that information to find exactly what they need to create their, their exploit and be successful. There's hard-coded credentials. Again, this is catastrophic. Why would you hard-code credentials into an application? This should not be, but it's a best practice on this list because it happens. There's also the race condition, otherwise known as TOC2, T-O-C, T-O-U. That stands for time of check to time of use. A system or an application attempts to perform two or more application or operations at the same time, even though the nature of the system should be done in a proper sequence. When an attacker exploits this, he has a small window of time between when the security control takes effect and when the attack is performed. This does make this attack difficult to exploit. That doesn't mean it's impossible. There are ways 
to do a race condition, for example, where you can do an exploit and have it done so fast that something like an antivirus won't pick it up because it, the antivirus moved too slow. There are unprotected APIs. Uh, it, it's like, why, why do you have this door wide open that it's not properly secured? Doing like HTTPS, validating parameters using strong authentication, making internal API documentation mandatory, not having uh, sensitive information publicly shown. Hidden elements can also be used to attacks kind of like you saw in the, in the prior examples, like uh, with click jacking. You could also do code signing. That is a, a way to ensure that the code being written and executed is the legit because it'll have a signature. Uh, not everyone does that because it might be expensive for them, but it is a way of securing the information, securing the, the code so that it is harder to manipulate, harder to break, harder to do things like uh, the cross-site scripting and everything else that we just mentioned. Oh, I see messages in the chat. Uh, let's see. I'll make it scroll down automatically. I don't remember what that's called. Uh, my internet speed is not the fastest in the world, but you are able, I mean, if you want, you can download the, the, uh, the 12 terabytes completely on your own. My, uh, my, my rainbow tables come from DEF CON. If you want the link yourself, I can send, I'll put that in the, um, in the Discord chat. Now let's make a quick video of that. And then I'll explain why we're gonna spend two weeks in this subject. Number one, because it's everywhere. And uh, I don't know about you, but I really don't think the web applications are gonna go away anytime soon. So I really want you to have some hands-on experience in, in the world of web app exploitation. If it ends up at the end of the two weeks, this is not for you. At least you are knowledgeable in it. But you also know it's not quite your thing. Oh, in the meantime, let's see if I can get those uh, that link to the rainbow tables. Uh, let's see. Let 
It's part of DEF CON and it's actually one of the villages. And what you normally do in the on-site DEF CONs is you would go to the village, you would give them a drive and they will copy the data on it. So you can walk out with, uh, uh, with the tables. Where is that link? So the hash types. As soon as I find that link, hopefully they haven't changed it. So here, as I wait for this to almost be done, it's projectrainbowcrack.com. Uh, that's the like the main source, but they don't provide you with the tables themselves. You could generate them, but that's going to take forever. Module 5 lecture, CIS 76, not made for kids. Wait for that to upload. Um, so, so you could generate them yourself, but that, like I said, that'll take forever and a day. No, that's not it. Yeah, let me find it. 
It's one of those things I have bookmarked somewhere. Okay. That is fully uploaded now. So I can record the next session. Okay. So like I said, we're gonna spend the next two weeks working in the realm of web security. The first week this week, you'll work in the Web Security Academy, working your way through SQLi, the command injection, the cross-site scripting, CSRF, click jacking, and directory transversal. If you are, if you just so happen to be enrolled in CIS 75, you've already done two of these, so you will have the other four to go. My suggestion is to use Burp Suite. Burp Suite already has a nice built-in browser that you can uh, that, that you can do these labs in without much hassle. Uh, I use Burp in the cloud just because if I'm going to do anything uh, malicious, I'm going to do it off of my computer, and that's why I have Google Cloud anyway. So. This is what you'll do in the first week. Next week, you'll jump in to these Try Hack Me rooms and complete them. So next week, we don't have a lecture. It's just working on these two items. So ideally, you'll complete this this week, and then next week, you'll make your way through the rooms. And just like before, you'll submit proof that you completed both uh, items and that that is the work cut out for you for the next two weeks. As always, I like to remind you that you are not meant to do this by yourself. You are expected and encouraged to work with others in the class that you use Discord to say, hey, who wants to team up with me? And you work on these labs together. There is no penalty for that. It is highly encouraged because the bad guys work together all the time. There is no reason why we are not working together. So please do not feel like you have to do this completely on your own. It is totally fine to work together. Any questions on the work for the next two weeks? Okay, I see no questions. Um, so as always, if you get stuck in anything, please ask away on Discord. I'll make that into a quick video. And I don't see any questions anywhere. So I see no reason why I should hold you hostage any longer. <laughs>